Hey guys, this is Comic Uno, and today I'm doing Comic Uno's Best Comics of the Week, and this is the show where I review all the comics I've read this week in one show. We go least favorite to best pick of the week and everything in between. And of course, at the end of the video, we talk about the viewer's pick of the week. So in the comments below, let me know your pick of the week for a chance to be featured on the episode. Now let's jump into this week's books. I had a, a rather big haul once again, 12 books this week, and number 12 for me was Danger Street issue one. This is a book I I, I want to say I picked up on whim because I, I usually don't pick up Tom King's books there's there's a few titles I've enjoyed from him but the the later titles that he's written I, hasn't really been for me so I haven't really been picking up many of his titles but I was interested to see how does you know a mythical character like Dr. Fate and then uh, a very old character uh, like Lady Cop become you know Syner uh, have synergy in, in, in one comic. So I was like, all right, let's see what this one's all about. Is it going to be grounded? Is it is it going to be mythical? Is it going to be fantastical? And, you know, it, it's a little bit of both. Uh, we get to see the, the more magic side with Dr. Fate and uh, definitely more of a cosmic side as well. Uh, but then you do get to see these grounded moments with Lady Cop. And I think that's the thing that I didn't enjoy about this book. It, it felt like it couldn't pick a side. There was a lot of dialogue in this too. It was kind of hard to get through some of the dialogue because of that. Uh, artwork was really good for this book though. I did like the grittiness to it. I thought that was balanced well, but it just wasn't really for me. So overall giving that two stars and that is number 12. Moving on to number 11, with, which is the last issue of Superman, Son of Kal-El, issue 18. It is continuing into a miniseries, but they actually start a new arc in this issue, which was weird. They introduced this newer villain, a new arch nemesis for, for Superboy, uh, Superman, John Kent. And, you know, I, I was like, okay, this could be an interesting, cool start to an arc because, like, cool, we're getting new characters. But it's a last issue to this 18-issue volume, and I thought it, there would be a little bit more touches of, okay, what has this series been all about? Uh, so I was a little disappointed with that. I didn't really feel like an ending chapter. And yes, you know, maybe it's not an ending chapter. We do have the, the next volume coming up, and it looks like it's going to continue in action comics. But I was looking for a little bit more heart, and I, that's kind of been my biggest complaint for uh, Son of Kal-El. You know, Tom Taylor's so great at, at writing character beats, and I, I feel like that this series has been missing the organic character beats I've wanted. And the coloring for me looked a bit saturated, so I, I, that wasn't really working for me. I wasn't sure if it was the printing or the digital version, like the actual pages of the book, but that the art style, or at least the coloring, looked a little off for me for this one. So overall, giving that two and a half stars, and that is number 11. Moving on to number 10, a book I was really looking forward to, and that is Invincible Iron Man issue one. And... You know, a lot of times with these issue ones for characters, we've we've been seeing a lot of new series for. The, the first issue always kind of feels the same. There's not much of a hook. And and I felt that way with Iron Man here, where, it, you know, it was explaining who he is, which I do think that you need with a first issue. You know, maybe this is the first Iron Man book anyone's ever picked up, but that takes up most of the issue. And then by the end, all right, someone's after him. He He's being hunted down. It looks like he's also going back to alcohol, which again, Again, is a story we've we've seen plenty of times with Iron Man. I just didn't feel like they were introducing anything new. I, I like the art. I even like the voice of this book. I feel like I'll probably pick up an issue two for it, but I, I just wasn't blown away as much as I wanted to. Uh, you know, there's also been a lot of titles this year and you know last year where we get to see issue ones kind of redefine the character. I think Punisher is a great example of that, and I always want that going into an issue one of a superhero book. And I don't really feel like this is redefining Iron Man. Or, or giving a different angle of Iron Man. Now, we might see that as issues go on, but with this issue one, I, I didn't really get that vibe. So overall, giving that three stars, and that is number 10. Moving on to number nine, and that is The Amazing Spider-Man issue 15. This book kind of continues to do a similar style of what we've been seeing with this series. Uh, not a lot of progression. You know, we, we got a lot of information in that dark web volume or that that one shot and now we are seeing the continuation of that and it's mostly an action issue uh, there are action pieces i enjoy here i thought doing more of the the movie version of venom making him funny honestly i kind of liked it i i like that vibe i thought it worked in it it worked really well with the art the art was so good really class a art style here especially for a more action driven issue uh, but i i don't care about chasm i don't care about ben riley and i don't know how to feel about 
Venom being this version of his character and being bad. And and other than that, I feel like it was a rather skippable issue. I don't actually think there was a lot of progression in this issue. And this is, you know, already issue two of this big event. I, I want more character moments. I want to feel like things are happening. And I'm, I'm just not getting that. And that's been my bigger critique of The Amazing Spider-Man for a while in general. So overall, giving that three stars. And that is number nine. Moving on to number eight, the topic of the video. Uh, I got this on whim. Batman Spawn issue one. Now, I'm, I love Batman. Batman is my favorite franchise from DC Comics. I don't know much about Spawn. Uh, you know, I, and that's why I was a little bit on the fence. Should I get this? Should I not? Will it be new reader friendly? But I'm like, this is going to be one of the biggest books of the year, or at least that's what it's been hyped up to be. Let me, let me get this book. And I think as someone who, you know, knows comic history and appreciates the medium of comics, I appreciated this book, right? You have Todd McFarlane writing this story, and then you have Greg Capullo who has drawn for Spawn and also drawn for Batman doing the art style for this. And obviously he he does wonderful art in this book. And uh, we get to see characters that are important to Greg Capullo's run on Batman. We, we got to see the Joker. We got to see the Court of Owls. Uh, and, and then, you know, we do get to see the mending of these two characters, why they're similar and, and why they would fight together and, and also why they're different. Uh, one's human, one's more magical. And, and I thought that was interesting, but as someone who's not a fan of Spawn, uh, I don't know if it really added much. I don't know if it made me a Spawn fan, which I think was, um, they tried to do, because they definitely explain the character. If you don't know anything about Spawn, it's like, all right, this character is explained, but I didn't feel for the character. I do think that this book is more for the people who love these two characters already and love the history of these two characters, because that's kind of the magicalness of it all. Uh, but as someone who's, you know, new to Spawn, I was like, all right, this, I understand why this could be a great book. It just wasn't for me. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I'm not upset that I got it. I, I'm happy to have it in the collection. I just don't think it blew me away as much as I wanted it to. And as much as, uh, you know, I think a big event like this should. Like, I think this this was an opportunity. And I know Spawn's already a very big series and, and people are reading it. But I think this is an opportunity to at least garner more Spawn fans. I don't know if it's going to garner more Batman fans. But maybe it would uh, garner people that used to like Batman and be like, oh, actually this is what's going on in Batman. Like, let me go check out some mainstream books. I've been on the indie train for a long time. And again, I don't know if that did that on either side. But overall, giving that three stars, was it worth the hype? Um, for me, it wasn't. Uh, but I'm sure out there it was worth the hype for, again, fans of, of these two franchises. All right, moving on to number seven, which is Monica Rambeau uh, Photon. And... I have never really read a Monica book. You know, I obviously know about the character. If you're a fan of Captain Marvel, she's a big part of that history. Uh, she's obviously been a big part of the MCU in, in recent years, so I know her from that. But, I mean, Monica has not had the spotlight in in decades, you know, and we, we don't really get to see the character very often. So when I saw that she was getting her own series, I'm like, yeah, I want to check this out. Like, you know, this is just a character we don't get much from. And it's interesting because I feel like this book kind of had a similar vibe to Iron Man, where it's like, okay, we need action. We need to kind of get people to know who this character is. And then you'll have this big cliffhanger to kind of show where the next issue is going. Uh, but nothing that's going to like blow your mind. But because this is a character we don't get to see very often, it, it kind of had a stronger umph because of that. You know, Monica, as a character you kind of do need to explain her history a little bit more she's not iron man you know most people know who iron man is at least the history of iron man so we got to see you know a little bit more information about monica um and then you know getting into her more personal life that was important too because we haven't seen her in a while um the action you know th there's some gorgeous artwork in this book so it was nice to see the action there now did this hook me and be like whoa i can't wait for issue two of monica no sadly but I feel like this gave me a little bit more to be like, I'm interested to see where issue two goes. So overall, I'm going to give that three and a half stars. And that is number seven, I believe. Moving on to number six. And, and this was a no brainer to get because it's such a cheap book. Uh, and this is Nightclub issue one. I mean, you're kind of giving this book to free at, at, at this point because it's $1.99 just to print this book. <laughs> you know, uh, printing's expensive. So already like Mark Millar and, and the team is like, all right, I want as many people to try out this first issue as I can, which is a really interesting kind of business move, right? Because then you can make your issue two the amount you normally would make it and you would have more people that may, might not try the book to try out the book. And for me, 
honestly, I think it did make me want to try out the book. I think I probably would have already. I like vampires. I like teen books. And I do like Mar Mark Millar's writing. So I think I would have leaned more towards the camp that I would have already gotten this book. But it definitely convinced me more to get the book. And overall... I liked the plot a lot. I thought the plot was really interesting where this guy, you know, wants to be this new next YouTube star because he wants money and he almost kills himself. A vampire uh, says, hey, I'm going to help you out. Uh, here's all these powers you have. And, and now he wants to be super famous and be pretty much a superhero with his vampire powers. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of a cool twist on the vampire lore. Like you usually just see them being vampires and never really get to see them being superheroes. But I like that. Now, the reason this isn't higher is I don't know if I like any of the characters. I don't know if the main character is really likable. I, I don't, I don't really like him. I didn't really love his words about social media. I think it, it was an easy one-two punch and, and I think social media and, and business online is a little bit more complicated than that. So I, I kind of had a, like a sore spot on that. And then I was like, oh, do I like him? I don't know. Do I like his friends? I don't know. But then they also felt like, I don't want to say real teenagers because I don't know if I, I, I want to say that, but they, they felt like what teenagers would do, or at least in, in the context of a story, what a teenager would do. Uh, so I, I'm a little torn on this book. It definitely gave me enough for an issue too, just because the plot was kind of wild and him just falling off that that building. I was like, whoa, okay, what's going to happen next? So, you know, there there could be a lot of twisted turns and the artwork was good. It felt gritty, but still had this brightness to for that teenage YA angle. Uh, and it had the hook, it had the ending. So I, I, I like the book. I just don't know if I like these characters. So overall giving that three and a half stars and that is number six. And also it's $1.99. How Pick up the book, give it a shot. All right, moving on to number five, which is Batgirls issue 13. Love this cover. So this issue, honestly, I think this is the best arc of Batgirls thus far. We get to see more from Stephanie's angle, Stephanie being Cassandra, but uh, we get to see her talk to Lady Shiva and kind of see where that really ships at. And, and Steph try to pretend to be Cassandra and, and kind of talk about her appreciation for her friend, all while Barbara is trying to reverse the spell, which was fun as well. Uh, so you kind of have the more fun superhero, superhero angle with with, again, reversing the spell and doing the Madame Zandu stuff. Uh, but then you get that personal character story with Stephanie and even a little bit with Cassandra. And then it looks like the next issue is going to focus a little bit more on Clue Master. And the artwork, especially the coloring, it was just so poppy and it worked. And honestly, I really think it's the strongest issue of the series thus far. I had a really good time with it. So overall, giving that four stars. And that is number five. Moving on to number four which is crashing issue four. This is the penultimate issue of a book that I feel like has been super under the radar. I, I hope you guys end up picking it up. Uh, but this is the issue where our main character has an overdose and still goes to work and and, and kind of fucks everything up because of it. Yeah, she loses her job. She She's not right right now you know her emotions are all over the place and and you really get to see okay well how did one pill become this and I really like that part of the issue I will say maybe I'm just uninformed about it but I I didn't know if you had an overdose you'd be able to do the things that she did I think that kind of took me out of the issue a little bit but um, I still really enjoyed the emotions we got from it. And again, the art was really good. It felt a little chaotic. The emotions felt really raw in this issue. And something I very much enjoyed is just the main character's voice in general. And I'm very curious to see where this last issue is going to end up going. So overall, giving that four stars, and that is number four. Moving on to number three, and this is Radiant Black, issue 20. And... This is a fun issue. This is how you do an action issue. You know, it, it makes it feel special that all these characters are coming together because you don't actually get to see the Power Ranger Radiant Black team come together very often. So we get to see not everybody, but mostly everybody come together. We get to see the two Radiant Blacks work together. We even get to see Radiant Red and, and how she gets out of jail for a moment to work together. Radiant Pink, a little bit from Radiant Yellow, and, and them trying to, to try to defeat this big mecha robot as they try to figure out, well, how's this connected to us? So it progresses the plot well. It, it has some good character moments because, again, you're getting all these voices interact interacting with each other, and it's been a while, so it feels special. And then you have some really wonderful action. I just thought it was a very well balanced issue and it makes me excited to see where the world of Radiant Black is going to go. So overall giving that four stars and that is number three. 
Moving on to number two, which is Dark Ride, issue three. And this is a book I've just been loving because it's just been moving so quickly. I feel like a lot of times when you have an ongoing book in general, like you could take your time with it. And this book's like no holds bar. Right from the get-go, we get to see what happens with the the, the granddaughter, I guess, of this, the you know, Disney type character um, who uh, hurts herself. And you're like, okay, what, what's happening here? And why are people getting hurt here? Why are there these things where there are, you know, um, secrets about people getting hurt? And, and really, how is this affecting the children? So we get a little bit of that. All while that, you know, that one employee who lasted there for a day, like the sister's trying to figure out what happened to her brother, that, that employee. And we find out by the end, you know, I think most books would be like take until issue 20 to figure out like, oh, what happened to this guy? And we're on issue three and, and that's the cliffhanger. And I'm like, wow, I really like the way this book moves. I love the art. I like these characters. The world is super interesting because it's about theme parks and uh, it's built, it builds its own theme park while still telling commentaries about other theme parks and theme parks theme park culture uh so really really solid book uh definitely jump onto this one and that is four stars and that is number two moving on to number one a book i love and i'm so glad that issue two was uh you know just as strong as issue one and that is bex issue two you know i love chris sheehan's artwork i really love his character acting there's moments where i think could have been described in dialogue but it wouldn't have been as strong if it was just dialogue like there's a lot of undercurrents of racism at the time and and the way they really showcase that obviously are the circumstances but they never say like this is happening because of racism it's just the the character acting you see it and you feel it and and it just it's done so well because that's really what this issue is about where we get to see our two main characters are dealing with this guy going missing and they're like well is he missing like what's happening and you're you're kind of living with the character of like oh maybe Maybe it didn't happen. Maybe, like, we don't know how these glasses work. And then it does happen. And then um, the the character, the best friend character, uh, who is black, does get arrested. And you get these undercurrents of racism that's going on during this time. And I just thought it, it was really well written. And again, you're, this book kind of just keeps you on your toes. And, and you're so interested in their relationship because the main character also has this big crush on him. And you're like, okay, is this going to come out at, at any time? Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of secrets happening. That, you know, what happened to the guy? What are the powers of these of these glasses? There's so many questions and it, it progresses so well in this issue. Um, and I just can't wait to see where it goes. I just love the world. I love these characters. And again, I like the progression of this book and the commentary it has as well. Uh, it doesn't have rose-colored glasses for the 80s where a lot of franchises would focus more on the nostalgia aspect, especially for something that is, uh, you know, the concept is nostalgia. You know, the glasses are about the glasses you used to see in 1950s ads of comic books. So it's really interesting to see more of a realistic approach to this time. And, and again, not have those rose-colored glasses on even though there's literal rose-colored glasses. Uh, but yeah, love this book. I think it's great. Uh, solid, solid issue. So that's four stars, and that's pick, my pick of the week. Let me know in the comments below what your pick of the week was. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. And the viewer's pick of the week for last week was do a powerbomb. And here are some comments about that. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. This is Comic Uno, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.